Okay, so let's get started. So what is new in C Sharp? Uh, so let's introduce ourselves a little bit. Fred, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, I'm Fred. Uh, I've been a Roslyn developer. Roslyn is C Sharp compiler for about uh, five years. Specifically, I've been in the compiler section, uh, working on both the compiler and the language for a little over three years. I'm a member of the C Sharp language design team, uh, and you can find me at 333Fred on GitHub. I do not have a Twitter. There is a 333Fred on Twitter. That isn't me. <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, my name is Christian Kevich. Um, I've been on the Rosin team for about three years, but I've been at Microsoft for nearly 10 now, wearing a whole bunch of different hats, doing a bunch of different things. Um, and I'm at Chisenki on GitHub, but you'll see me on the Rosin repo. And if you want to come uh, chat on Twitter, I'm Chisen99, and we do all sorts of interesting chatting with customers. So feel free to come and come and come and talk to me there. Um, I also just want to add, like, as we are working from home, I've got the dog in the room, and he does love to let me know if the mail carrier arrives, and it's early enough that they may. So I apologize in advance if he... Uh, makes a guest appearance this morning. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? We've got, we kind of split this talk into two halves. We've got a bunch of C-sharp nine demos, which is all the things we released in uh, .NET 5 back in November. And then we've got a second half of the talk where we're gonna look about what's, the, what's in store for the future of C-sharp and some of the features you might see coming up in uh, C-sharp 10. So with that, how about we get into some demos? Let's go look at some code, hey? Demos look fun to me. Sounds good. Slides are boring. Indeed. <laughs> All right, let's start here. So we've got a pretty standard uh, Hello World program here. And, you know, that's fine, but there seems to be a lot of code here just to print something to the screen. So, There's 12 lines. Um, yeah. So what do you think, Fred? How can we make this simpler? Well, I have an idea. Why don't we delete everything but system.console.writeline? Okay. Literally I everything mean... in the file. It seems interesting. And but it's not does that, it. does that run? Let's find out. Oh, wrong demo. Helps to select the, the right demos. It does help to select the right demo. <laughs> Indeed, it does run. Look at that. Hello, well, with only a single line. So what's going on here? So in C Sharp 9, we added a new feature called top-level statements. Uh, and the idea here is that you can have a single file in your project that instead of, uh, in, in, you can put statements on the top level, but you can, these come before namespaces, they come before, they come after usings, uh, if you have any, but they come before, in between the, the usings and the namespaces in your file. And the idea is you can just write code in there and it will be executed as as your main method and the the idea here is that this is all kind of just the compiler takes it and it puts it inside of a main method inside of a class for you and you know you don't have to do all the boilerplate of writing uh you know 12 lines of code just to get uh, a main method and and this can be particularly useful when you're like trying to do something real quick you know and you you just want to write some code uh and you don't have to what? It's just much easier. What about async? I mean, can I can I still await things here? How does that work? Yeah, so the compiler is smart here, and it will make this main method async if you want to do something that is async. And so here it will actually just implicitly notice, hey, you put an await in the body of this method. I'll make the method async. It's not going to be async unless you do that, right? unless you right. have an await in there. Uh, but it will... Uh, figure out what you want it to do. If you want to return something, it'll figure out you want it to return an int, right? It it will it will just work. Nice. And I mean, you mentioned about usings there. So does that mean I can get rid of these fully qualified bits here and just do a regular using like I would in any other C sharp file? Yeah, and yeah, really uh, it gives you the whole quick fixes to remove things. But you know, you can That's delete good. them manually too. Uh, <laughs> But well, yeah, uh, use it, it as I said. It comes between the usings and any namespaces in the file, nice. um, and you can only have one of these per per program. You don't have to worry about oh, if I have two, like which one gets executed first? It doesn't. It just doesn't compile. Uh, so one right. one file with top level statements in it per right, per which is program. essentially because it's essentially the main method, right? It's saying you, in the same way you can't have more than one main method. Yep. And how about like uh, functions and stuff? I mean, I'm I'm in just some code. Can I have functions in this file? Can I, you know, well, make more complicated? Why don't you give it a try? Okay, let's try and make a let's try and make our hello be a little more interesting. Here, we have a function. 
Okay, that seems okay. And then can I call it? Seem to compile. Uh, yeah, let's try it. Okay, so look at that; it's working. So how how is this working? What's going on here? Yeah, so so like I said, everything in the in the top level statements is implicitly wrapped in a main method. And so what this means is say hello is a local function, right? Like you can write in any other function, uh, say hello is just a local function. The difference cool. is that uh, we you can't call it, like you can put other classes after and, and namespace stuff after uh, top level statements. And we make the name say hello visible there but we don't let you call it. We, we error because it's a local function, but we don't want to make sure you're not accidentally thinking, oh, I'm calling this method from uh, um, uh, like from, from not, not the main method. And so we just, we basically, we, we say we put it in scope. We make it, we right. make the name visible, but we don't let you use it. Right, so we can see it, but we're saying, hey, no, you can't call this thing. This is a, this is a local function. This is not something that you can call from down here. Yep. No. And this is interesting. So I can declare classes in my top level statements as well. Yep. And so, and after, after your top level statements, you can have, you know, your normal namespace declarations, type declarations, etc. cetera. Um, you can't mix, you can't put as, as Chris is about to demonstrate, you can't put them in between. Uh, we, we think that will be confusing. And so we disallowed it. Um, they have to be continuous and then you have the rest of your type declarations. Right, so we're essentially saying that like everything between uh, the usings here and the first class declaration, right? So this is essentially yep. our main method, right? So it, yep. it, rather than having all that ceremony, we can just work out which bit is the main and then everything underneath is just a regular C sharp file at that point, right? Yep. And it's, That's again, it's particularly helpful. And I've used this several times when you're just, you wanna write a quick script to do something and you can just open it and start writing and you don't have to think about nested methods and those programs often don't even have a, a class in them. But nice. Okay, cool. So that was what did we call that top level statements? Indeed. Fantastic. What else can we? What else do we ship in C sharp nine? Well, uh, hmm, maybe let's have a look at declaring some types a little bit better. So we've got this class, and maybe it's got some fields. So we've got a new person, and then maybe we should have some complicated type, right? Of some nested thing, and maybe that's got a you know a list. And this is kind of a lot. annoying, right? Because I've got to write everything twice. And you know, ideally, I guess what I'd like to be able to do is just say, oh, rather than this thing, what if I could just say var? And right. I can't, right? This is a, this is a request that we've gotten over and over for putting for var fields. Now we haven't added var fields. Uh, we're concerned about some of the performance implications of var fields, and we're also concerned from a conceptual standpoint of this is a public API, or potentially public API, and right. we're concerned about as accidentally changing your public API. And C# -sharp has always been very explicit about wanting to make sure that you are. Very explicit about what your public API actually is, um, right? And so, because if if I was inferring this from some function, we'd be saying, "Oh, this type here is actually being declared by the function." And even if the function is off in some other source file or even a library, if that changes, then I'm implicitly changing my public API, right? So we're right. saying this this is potentially bad, and we don't want to do this, right? Yeah. So what we've added instead is the ability to get rid of the other side, and so. Instead of getting rid of the left side, you can get rid of the right side with target type new. Um, and we also have some nice quick fixers. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> let me let me do it the, the fancy way then, so we can say, oh, oh, I can use new, new. and there yeah. we go, less code. That's code. And so this is not only helpful for field initializers, but it's also helpful uh, for places like this dictionary where you might be initializing keys and values to new types of things, right? Var couldn't help you there. If you have, a, if you have an object or collection initializer, uh, you're going to have to type new over and over again for these cases. Right. Um, so, so here, in fact, let's, let's, let's flip this around, in fact, and use our, uh, our new syntax up here too, because we can use it anywhere else as well right it's not just yep. in fields so i can say oh this person's new but here now if i wanted to create this dictionary 
I would say, uh, oh, helps to make it public. If I wanted to actually initialize this dictionary, then, okay, before I would have had to gone in and type out this huge big thing, because yep. now instead I can just say, oh, no, this is just a new thing. And then I can do it in the nested types too, right? I can say, uh, this, the thing I'm putting in here is also a, a new, and that's going to say, oh, that's going to make a new dictionary, and then this new list thing. So rather than repeating the types over and over and over again, I can just very quickly say, no, the compiler knows what this type is going to be, so just figure it out for me, right? And you can see here it knows that this is a dictionary string of the dictionary, right? Yep. And the, the really nice thing about this is that it, it helps you, again, in places where var couldn't help you, right? Var, in, adding var fields wouldn't have helped you here, wouldn't have made this more succinct. Right, um, you'd still have so, to write out the full type, right? Yep, yep. And so generally the advice that I've, I've been using is if I'm declaring a new local, I'll probably just use var uh, because that's what everyone is used to. But if I'm declaring a field or if, you know, any other case where var doesn't work, that's where, that's where you can use new. Nice. Oh, and then I've got one little extra feature I always like to show off in these kind of uh, making it easier to code kind of things. Uh, so imagine if we, I mean, we can see we've declared person, um, but if it was coming in from somewhere else and we wanted to check if it was null, then, you know, we'd always say, oh, okay, X is not equal to null and go do something. But then we started telling people, we, the, you know, the C sharp, uh, environment started saying, well, actually, this is this is tricky, right? Because we have operator overloads, and so person could override this not equal, and it could say it's not null when it is, and you could end up with a null reference exception, right? So we, we kind of started saying as a, a good guidance is to instead say, oh, when x is object. But it's kind of backwards in my head, right? It's like, well, okay, down here we know that it's not null, but I'm testing for it, you know? It's like, it just feels weird. Uh, and so I was so happy to see that in C sharp nine we can now just say instead is not null. Right? Yeah, and there's so, there's there's a lot of new patterns in C sharp nine. We're not going to have right. time to get into all of them today, but not is one of the new patterns. So in C sharp eight you could say X is null, and now we have a new pattern not, and you can use not. Uh, right. So this this is pattern. an is this is an is test, right? I'm saying X is, and then the pattern is not null, so it, it, it inverts, right? Lovely. So I just think that's one of those really nice little, you know, paper cut kind of things that like, ultimately it doesn't really change the code. It doesn't make it more efficient. It doesn't do anything. But for me as a writer, I can now look at it and just say, ah, oh, this is so much more obvious what this code is doing. So I just, I love this little feature. Okay. Right. That seems cool. Uh, should we look at some other things? How about yeah, I mean, we, was that? We've done some types. Let's do some more types. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Let's go look at a new feature here. So in this system, we've got uh, some types there. We've got this thing called name point and it's got a couple of fields on it or it's got a couple of properties on it and it's got a derived type with another property. And in our system, we say, oh, okay, we've got these, you know, they just got some values, right? They're just a collection of values. And in an ideal world, we want to be able to compare them, right? And say, oh, well, this, point A has all the same values as this point B. So in our system, we should think they're equal. But when I run them, they're not, right? Yeah. And why aren't class, those comparing equals? Classes have reference equality by default, right? Uh, if, they, if you change those to structs, it would work. Uh, right, because, so let's change these well, to structs. Well, they would kind of work. Kind of. <laughs> so why, if, why, if, what's the problem here? If we had struct inheritance, they would work. Uh, but ah, structs. so right. So I've got inheritance hierarchy and we can't inherit between structs, right? So structs give us value types, but they don't, or give us value semantics, but we don't, we can't pass them by reference and we can't inherit from them and stuff. Yeah. So essentially what we're saying is we want a class, but we want it with value semantics. Right. So, and so previously you you'd have to like go implement all of these operators, right? You have to implement equals and you have to implement uh, I equatable and perhaps you want to implement uh, not the equals and not equals operators. And it was a lot. Right. Um, yeah, so, so, so we have a new feature in C Sharp 10 uh, where we can change, or C Sharp 9, sorry. <laughs> C Sharp 9, where we can change this class to record. And the idea behind a record is that it is a class type. It is a reference type 
with value like semantics. And so what that means is it compares equality by value. So it, it looks at the value of X and the value of Y in this case. Um, and then if name point is a record as well, Ah, so that's interesting. Like it's saying only a record. So does that mean once I make something a record, I kind of have to make everything else a record too? Correct. We do have some intention in the future to to investigate like allowing cross record and not record and in inheritance, but that's uh, not in the language currently. But if, so a bit like a class versus struct. Once you're one thing, you're in that world, and you can't right. you can't just sort of mix and match them. Right. Okay, great. Now these these are classes. To be clear, they are reference types. Um, okay. So that means that you know they they are allocated on the heap, and they're passed uh, they're passed mutably or. or the references are passed by value instead of yeah, instead yeah. values being passed by value. Yeah. So I still get on my inheritance hierarchy. I can still pass them around by, by reference. But now when I when I run them, they now compare true. So that's pretty cool, right? So what, how's, what's going on under the hood here? How's this, how's this actually working? Well, so records bring with them a whole bunch of boilerplate, basically, stuff that you have to write manually. So they bring with them an implementation of IE equatable. Uh, they bring with them an implementation of equals. They bring with them an implementation of double equals and not equals, the operators. Um, they bring with them a nice two string. Uh, they we bring with that. them... So if, we, if we print our A, in fact, look, there we go. We can say, oh, here's actually the values of this, right? So when it was yep. a class, it would have just been, here's some name point, whereas here we actually get the values because we, we're telling the compiler, this is really a collection of values, but I still want it to be a reference type. Yep. Um, but then there's one there's one concern with the code you have right now. I have a concern, Chris, uh, yeah. which is that the because records are value like classes, it means that uh, change that, that if you like pass it or if on another thread and someone else potentially tries to modify that value, they can at the moment. And so what if you were using that value as a key to a dictionary? That's, that means that you've lost it. You can't get access to it anymore. Right. Um, and so in C Sharp 9, we added a new feature. And you know this, this will work, unfortunately. Um, right. So, so it's saying I can, I can modify, but they no longer compare true, right? Because yeah. although I've done it here, obviously, this could have happened in some other function, on some other thread. Like you know, I, I checked that it was true, and they just changed it from underneath me, right? So, yeah. so how can I stop my handmade? Yeah. So in C Sharp 9, we added a new feature for properties called init only. And so the idea with init only, and you can change set to init here. Uh, so the idea with this accessor is that you can only use and only access it uh, in an object initializer. So this the, the new named point up there, perfectly this, fine. This is valid. Yeah. But that but reassignment, not, not valid. Uh, and so nice. one of the one of the things that we would see people constantly doing is they they go oh constructors you know especially across class hierarchies it can be painful um, and but and and the only way to get around that is to use an object initializer right uh, but object initializers require that you make the object world mutable because there's no there's no more fine grained than that well in C sharp nine now you can say init and then you can only modify that property in the object initializer while the right. object is still under construction as we say so it's as soon as it's it's created it's 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 not settable anymore right so during creation it's like oh this thing can change you can set it in a constructor you can set it in the initializer but as soon as it's done that's it it's locked and you're you can't change it going forward right yep nice um, cool that but that sounds good i mean that seems good so let's put these on all of our all of our things but what if, how do i now make a new one of these, right? If I want to, you know, before I could have just said uh, R C equals B and then set my X or whatever, but now we're saying, oh, I can't do this. So how can I change these things once they're made? If they're sort of sealed at the point of creation, how can I, you know, make copies right. of them and such? So what we have in C Sharp 10 is we have a feature called with expressions. And the idea here is you may be familiar with this if you've ever done uh, more functional programming languages, basically. Um, but the idea here is you can say with, you say, so you say space with, and then you give an object initializer. And then you can change whatever you want. And so what this does is non-destructive mutation. And basically it, it creates a copy of the object you are withing. And that copy, can you can set the, the with expression is part of the initialization, it's still under construction. 
And so you can set the values as part of this this object initializer in a width. Nice. And just to confirm, we can we can we can print both of them in fact, and we can show that look, we they are actually different. So B B kept its value of one because we couldn't change it once we created it, but now C has the same everything else except this X is two. So that's pretty cool. Right. Huh? Yeah. I nice. think so. Yeah. So these these are interesting. I like this, but there's still a lot of code. You know, like I'm looking at a lot of got a lot of publics and gets and nits and stuff. So can I make this simpler? Can I make this easier? Well, you can, as long as you are okay with the idea that a point or a named point has a uh, position or add, add, yeah, that the, these things have positions. And what we've done is we've basically added primary constructors for records. Okay. And so on the type itself, you can say uh, open paren int x comma int y close paren. And then you can get rid of all the rest of the code. And so what this means, and, and put a semicolon there. Uh, and so what this means when you have int x and int y in these, these primary constructor positions is that means we'll create a public init only property, we'll assign the value and, and we'll create a constructor with these parameters in this order, and we will assign the values from those parameters to those properties. Nice. Um, and so presumably now this is a constructor, I have to go up here and put these in, oh, well, no, no, it's because of name point. So, uh, yeah, so this is saying that the, the point doesn't, so how can I, I obviously have in, uh, inheritance, but I need some way of calling the base constructor. So how can I like pass those things through? Right, and so you can do this by defining your own primary constructor and then just putting the parens on the base type itself. Ah, like this. Uh, nice. Yes, it's up, uh, uppercase the Y. Thank you. This is why, yeah. All right. Okay, and now I'm here. So we're now saying, oh, so because before these were optional, right? I could have made a point without a Y at all because although yes. we, we could init it, we could have just omitted it and that would still be valid. So now we're saying, no, no, we absolutely have to have all of these things, right? So this has to have a name and it has to have a value and its other value. And then I don't even need these object initializers, right? Because I've got this right. constructor. So that's pretty neat. Uh, all that code's gone down to, well, there's actually four lines of code there minus our right line. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, maybe three lines of code minus the right lines. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is the name point in that. So that's pretty cool. Um, so this, we feel like, Essentially, we're saying we've now got this kind of third type of thing, right? Which is like, it's a, it is a reference type, but we've got these value semantics on it. And they're kind of, I mean, these look very much like sort of anonymous types almost in a way that named, right? So is that a, a good analogy to think about these as? That is a very good analogy to think of them as. Uh, records are a parallel to anonymous types. They are, they are named anonymous types in that anonymous types, they come with most of these things already, right? They come with equality implementations. They come with two strings. They're immutable. Uh, you can't put them in places, right? You can't put them in the signature of something. Uh, but records, you can, and records can be part of your public API. And they're a very simple way of declaring these containers of values. Right, and so these kind of data types of like, I have a collection of values, I wanna treat them as a whole thing, but I also still want to pass them by reference and maybe inherit and, you know, so, so a lot, I don't need, I don't, I, I can't use structs because of all those limitations, right? So it's this kind of third thing, so almost somewhere in the middle. Yep. Nice. Okay, cool. Well, that was a, a quick tour of some C-sharp nine. Should we go, should we go see what we're thinking about shipping in the future? That sounds like fun to me. And unfortunately we just have slides here, but yeah, because, there, we, no, we did put this... some code on the slides. So. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're, uh, Visual Studio isn't, isn't yet in, in, in a, a state to share some of this stuff off. And I want to point out, so this is C-sharp 10 and beyond. So we're not promising anything here, right? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've tried to, most of the things on here I'm relatively confident about, but I'm, we've pulled things at the last minute before. And so, you know, I don't, don't take anything as, this is definitely shipping in C-sharp 10. It, yeah, Hopefully we're, we're not we're not committed to this. Don't go, don't go tell your manager that oh we can use this feature in C sharp ten. We hope hopefully this is what's coming, but it, there may be some changes. So 
So what's the first thing we've got? Okay, so uh, the first feature we're going to talk a little bit about is a uh, file scope namespaces. So it turns out that if you look at the majority of C sharp code, 99.9% .9 of all files have uh, basically uh, a set of usings and then a namespace and then a bunch of code under that namespace. And all the classes that you declare are all in that same namespace. And it turns out that that's fine, but obviously as soon as you put things in a namespace, you've got to indent them. And so basically every C sharp file sits with this indentation on the left. And okay, we've got wide monitors, but it's still kind of a weird thing about the language, right? That everything's always indented in this namespace. And so one of the features we're looking at shipping is uh, this file scope namespace where you can say, hey, everything in this file is actually in this namespace and you don't have to put the braces in. So you can have your usings and you just go, oh, this file everything declared exists in this namespace XYZ. And so my class down here is now in that XYZ namespace. Um, you can't like nest them, you can't have a second namespace. And so we're not gonna get into that thing of making it unobvious. Like if you need to do that, you can still use the braces, you can go through nest them. But for that really common case now, you can just say, yep, this, this file uses this namespace, all the code in this file uses this namespace. And to, to be clear, he wasn't making up that 99.9%. Uh, right. we, we did a scan of code both inside Microsoft and, and on GitHub for, for a very, very large set of code, millions of lines and millions of files, uh, and literally somewhere between 99.7 and 99.9% .9 of code was like right. this. It's, 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 it's would, be, would benefit from this file scope in this way. So hopefully this is something that everyone is going to benefit and use. And then... On the flip side, so we kind of we're trying to make it easier to declare namespaces, but we'd also like to make it easier to actually use them and consume them. And so, in a sort of similar theme, it's pretty common that most of your files in your compilation are going to use system, right? And if you're using async and you're using tasks, then most files are going to be using system.threading.task, right? And so, there's these kind of common namespaces that basically all your files are using. And it would be really nice if you could just declare them in one place and have them just flow through the rest of your project. Um, and so that's this feature we're looking at called global usings. And so a global using, it's still in source, but it says, okay, this make this namespace available globally across all the other files in the compilation. Um, and so once you've declared it once, it's then in scope in every other file. And so you can essentially just have a single file, which is your like, you know, global usings.cs. And you can go in and just declare a bunch of namespaces, and then those will be implicitly available in all the other files in your, in your compilation. So you can get away with removing some of this boilerplate. And again, with things like the, the nice file name, name file scoped namespace, you can really shrink that top bit of your file that we kind of just gloss over anyway, because it's always the same in most projects. Um, and really will only have the usings that are important to the code that's underneath. So it just kind of clarifies and makes things simpler. And the other really nice thing is that you can you can use aliases as well as global. So here you can see we've got like a Unicode char or the my tuple. And so if you've ever used aliases in a file, like particularly like that example we had earlier in the, the demo where we had like a dictionary of dictionary of list and it's really like painful writing out this complex type over and over again. Like a lot of people like to alias this. They say, oh, this thing represents some domain type. But those aliases obviously only exist in that file. And so if you want to share them between multiple files, you have to copy that alias through. And so with global usings, you now have this very lightweight way of sharing that amongst all your files. You can say, oh, actually, throughout this project, wherever you see you know, my odd list, that's what I mean. And we can then share it out to everyone. So it's a, a really kind of nice thing and just, just makes consuming these things a little bit simpler. And you'll also, you'll also note that you know, today you can't use uh, car, or you can't use a tuple syntax as an alias. Right. Yeah, so we're, we're actually improving that as well. So these these are not things you could you could even do today. So the tuples especially. I mean, that's why I said dictionary, because that's something you can do today. But yeah, and this is, a, again, a really common request for people, because tuples are really nice for these kind of lightweight data structures, right? Like, you've just got two values, or just you want to quickly pass a pair of things around. Um, but it'd be really nice to name them. And so that's something that we're going to enable as well, which should be pretty nice. 
All right. So, uh, I mean, I can't see who's watching this, but, you know, raise your hand at home if you've ever written code like this and uh, hoped it would work. <laughs> right. Um, and so, you know, we've, we, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, and so the, the problem here, you know, is of course that the C Sharp compiler isn't smart enough to understand that, uh, you know, if, if you're comparing to not null to something that's definitely not null, it will always have executed. You know, we can, you know, as a human, you can look at it and you can say, yeah, obviously that's going to execute. Uh, how, how, the variable is going to be assigned, but the compiler wasn't smart enough. So fine, I'll factor it out and I'll do, I'll do a not equal to null and and a dot b, right? Like, like we're back in C-sharp 4. Uh, <laughs> but we don't, we don't want to do that. And so in, in C-sharp 10, we're going to be teaching the compiler uh, how to understand these types of constant comparisons and propagate information through them. And so in C-sharp 10, this code will compile and run. Yay! Um, and so this is going to be uh, something that we can do for all types of constant comparisons. Uh, so if b, so you know, a dot b could be a try get that returns a bool, or maybe it returns some other thing, right? It could return an int or a string or anything else that we can uh, compare with a constant and definitely know. Because you know, if if it's your local variable, we don't know what the state is, so it could be comparing to null. But if it's comparing to something that's definitely not null, then we can figure it out. Um, and this will work for things like conditional access, uh, things like null coalescing, uh, some ternary improvements as well. Uh, the full the full example is in this GitHub issue with with the whole spec. Um, nice. But that's so we're, we're just teaching the compiler that like, hey, this is this is this is clearly initialized, right? Like, yes, you don't. Yeah, there's no there's no ambiguity here. So like, why not let me use this? Precisely, because um, yeah, everyone's written code like this, and then they curse at the <laughs> compiler when it doesn't work. And so hopefully the so cursing will go down. Let's make that make the compiler smarter. Sounds good to me. Yeah. And then here we have uh, what we're calling semi-auto properties. So this is the field keyword. This is far and away the most requested feature on C Sharp Lang. Uh, like not even, not even close between this and the uh, and the related feature we might look at in the future uh, called property scoped uh, fields. By far the most the most requested thing. And so the idea here is if anyone has ever done I notify property changed, then you know that you have and and that's me and that's Chris. Uh, then you you know that as soon as you need to go into make an I notify property changed property in your view model, okay, well fine. So I have to create a back a private backing field and then I have to return it from the get and then in the set I have to take a ref to it and I probably have some helper in the class that calls the notify property changed event for me and uses a uh, caller member name in order to like make it better and uh, so much. So much code. <laughs> um, when it would be really nice if you could just do this, right? And you just say, look, give me a backing field. And just in the set, let me let me call my helper that does set and raise for me, uh, and then the get is just just as it was, right? Totally not modified at all. Right. Um, so so th this field you're saying is not is not some field that I've declared, right? It is not. It is a contextual keyword. Uh, if fields, if you don't have a field or or property or other name in your type named field. Uh, just like var, if you don't have a type named var, then it, it means infer the type. This field refers to the backing field of the type, unless you have some other name. Right. Uh, so that, so this, this gets a value from here, right? This is saying, oh, yep. this thing is a string. Yeah. Well, it's a string and then with um, the appropriate nullable adjustments. So for example, you might have a lazily, you might have some property that is lazily computed, right? And so the getter for that would be field question question equal compute my expensive property. Right. Um, and so, so, you, field... so you, you can put null into the backing property, but yep. we, we won't expose that through the, 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 exactly. the actual and we'll, property. We'll do the appropriate nullable analysis to, to just make it work. Um, so nice. if, if you always make sure that the, that the property is set to some non-null value at the end of your setter and at the end of every constructor, okay, the backing field won't be null, right? You can't, you're never, you can just return the backing field and that's fine. Right. If you're, there's a chance that you actually did set it to null in the setter, or maybe you didn't initialize it or something like that, then we'll warn you and say, hey, right, you yeah. didn't initialize this thing. It could be null. You need to make sure you're not returning null. Yeah. And so the, hopeful, the hope is that it will just work. 
Nice. Well, as someone who's written a lot of code where I really wish, and especially not even just for an XY property change, but like they want to do like a small bit of validation before I set it or whatever, right? Like, or you want to log the value. Yeah, I'm so excited for this. This is just like one of those like small changes that is just gonna, I'm gonna, every time I use it, I'm gonna smile. So I'm very excited for this. Okay, uh, so it's struct improvements. So we, this is kind of part of some related features. But we're basically looking to make your life easier when you're using structs. And so today, structs have quite a few limitations on the way you can actually create them and what you can do with them. And in C-Shot 10, we're looking at lifting some of those restrictions. Um, so one of those things is field initializers. So you're saying, oh, I have a struct. I want it to have a value. Like I want a, a field in my struct to have some value. Um, and today, you have to write constructors, you have to pass these things through, um, and that's kind of a pain. And so we're saying, well, actually, no, you can just, you can just initialize that value. Just, you can say, you know, my field is value one, and that's, 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 uh, that's okay. And in concert with that, we're, we're actually allowing what we call parameterless struct constructors. So today in the language, if you try and create a constructor for a struct that has no parameters, we don't allow you to do that. We say, this is not something you can do. Um, you know, for, for various reasons, this is this is disallowed. And we're basically gonna say, well, actually maybe now we will let you do this. And that's part of this initializer too, because before you would always have to take the value uh, and then set it in. And now you say, oh, well, we can have the initializer, that's fine. And we can have a parameterless constructor. And that's because the initializer really implies a parameterless constructor. And so these two things together mean that we just make structs a little bit easier and a little bit simpler to create. Um, and really, again, just just, cut down on your typing, remove the, the you know, the, the space for bugs to make these things easier. Yeah. And so in, in concert with these improvements to structs, we're looking at allowing you to actually make structs be records. And so with all the record things we were looking at, we said, oh, well, you know, records are great because they're, they have reference types, uh, but they have value semantics, right? And we even said, oh, maybe we'd like to use a struct. Um, but actually it turns out that records have a bunch of other good stuff, right? Like with all that equality and the printing and, and um, the uh, primary constructors, right? And so, well, actually it turns out the records would be really nice if we could say, well, we want all that stuff from record, but we actually do want it to still be a value type, right? Not just have value semantics. Um, and so that's where we're looking at introducing record structs. Um, and so really you can kind of think about this as like the four quadrants now where we have, we have structs and we have classes. And so we have uh, structs are value types, they're passed by value, classes are passed by reference. And then we have records, which are record classes, which are passed by uh, reference, but with value semantics. And then we have record structs. So they're passed by value, but they get all the other good stuff with uh, equality and withers and um, uh, printing of members and stuff. Um, so, and so Chris, we, we said that anonymous types were a good analogy for record classes. Is there a good one right. for record? Yeah. Classes? So, so this essentially is, is custom tuples, right? This is named tuples. Um, and so we said that, oh, well, you can, you can name your tuples and aliases. Well, now you can actually, with this feature, you're essentially saying we can define it. So, I mean, here we've got this, uh, method on our double. But if we didn't, this would just be, you know, we could just have a, a semicolon here. And this is now an, a named tuple of two values, X and Y. And it works just like the tuple type does, um, except it's got a name and this is a public name, right? I can actually, I can put this in assembly and have people reference it elsewhere. So it just kind of completes that, uh, you know, we have, we have classes, anonymous classes, uh, records are anonymous classes. And now we have record structs, which are uh, tuples. So it's pretty nice. Very cool. All right. And another thing we mentioned earlier is how properties don't require you to set anything, right? Uh, you can have an init and, and no one, you could construct a point without actually initializing point, or you could construct a named point without actually giving it a name if you use. Right, we setters. said that we could, we could just delete that y equals and it was fine because yeah, it was just no a property, right? Well, I mean, you cared in your code right. when you got an uninitialized value, but uh, the consumer didn't care. And so the thing with properties, right, is that they haven't, properties and fields and anything in object initializers haven't been required since C-sharp one. Um, 
And in fact, uh, you couldn't even, there wasn't a property, there was no object initializer in C-sharp 1. Um, and so the idea here with required properties and really required members is that we're giving you a new modifier. Uh, currently, we're thinking the word required as a modifier. That might change, but you know, I, I, I think we're relatively close there. Um, that you can put as a modifier on your properties or on your fields. And the idea here is that your types, your classes, and your structs can define that these are the set of properties or fields that this type requires the user, the, the creator of this type to set. Um, and <clears throat> so that means that in this, in this new person that we have down here, if you removed first name or last name, you would get an error because the right, property so I, is if required. I take, if I take this out, the compiler is going to shout at me, right? Exactly. Uh, and the reason the reason that we're really interested in doing this is because constructors don't necessarily work well across type hierarchies, right? Like if you have, if you want to create and require a property today, you have to take it through the constructor. And so what that means is at a minimum per class, you need to repeat the name of that property four times, once for the, once for the property, once for the, uh, a parameter and then twice for assigning the parameter to the property and then repeat the type twice right once for the property and once for the parameter and then at every level of the hierarchy underneath for every constructor that calls it you need to take the property type and you need to take and, and you pass it up to the base constructor and the, there are lots of code generation solutions to this roslyn has an ast that that you know has a bunch of constructors in it. You know we have 203 bound node types that inherit from bound node, and so if we want to go and add a new property to bound node itself, that's 203 constructors we need to update. Right. We don't do that. And, and it gets even worse when you have like multiple levels of hierarchy, right? Oh, because yeah. you have this just this explosion of constructors where you're passing things around and duplicating, and it, it's it's yeah. unpleasant, right? And so people have and and. They, then you have cases like DTOs, right, and other other objects that are instantiated via reflection, uh, that that have that require a parameterless constructor, and because they require a parameterless constructor, when you turn on nullable, all of your not null fields go, yeah, but you didn't assign it in this constructor, and you go, well, it's not my responsibility. Whoever's creating me is responsible for doing this, uh, and so that that required allows you instead of instead of like silencing the warning as we tell people to do today with like equal null bang, you can just mark it required, and then uh, the, these become effectively parameters. We call them property parameters to your constructors, um, and just every constructor inherits this this uh, required member list by default. So this this default the default constructor does if you define one it automatically gets it and then we'll have syntax for allowing you to say no 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 this constructor will satisfy everything by itself. Right. And then you don't have to do anything there. Nice. All right. And then finally we have something that you know the rest of the stuff we've talked about we're hoping to get in for C# -sharp 10. This we're hoping to get a preview in for C sharp 10. Uh, and so you, you'll, you'll install a .NET 6 SDK, and then you'll have to set the language version to preview to try this out. Uh, but this is some really cool stuff around static member, abstract static members and interfaces. Because today you can, you can define static members with bodies and interfaces, and that's fine, but it doesn't allow you to do things like generic math, right? In order to, in order to implement a generic addition over addable numbers, you need to be able to say, oh, and I will use the operator plus of the thing that actually gets subbed into me, right? Whatever, whatever T actually gets substituted for. Um, and you don't have a way to say that today. And so we're looking at uh, basically allowing you to say static abstract. And so the idea here is that I can have my addable interface, which has some zero value and some ability to add a T and a T and get back a T. And so you might have int, for example, implements this by, and you, we have two versions here, the ex, what, what an explicit implementation might look like and what an implicit implementation might look like. Um, but yeah, so you have, you have uh, int implements it in this way, and then next slide. All right. Um, and then you can make this method at all that operate, operates over 
anything that's addable, right? And so it starts with some zero, which calls a static property, and then all for every element, it just adds the result because, you know, we have, we can add t's together and that just works. And then we return the result. And so you can use it with ints, or you can use it with floats, or you can use it with your own custom type that, you know, maybe you have a, a rational type that you imp implement, that you have implemented iAddable on. Uh, to be clear, iAddable is just the a straw man name. Uh, everything in here, we're still designing how the interface setup is actually going to look. Um, but the idea is that we're going to ship these, these uh, interfaces in the uh, base class library in the BCL, and you can use them yourself. Um, yeah, and so that's and, that's. And, the I guess if anyone's ever done Rust, this feels a lot like kind of traits, or it is to say very like... much like traits. Yeah. Um, nice. There are there are a lot of names for this type of thing, uh, yeah. traits type classes, and it's very similar. Uh, there is. There's still some stuff that we need to add to make them real, really like it, like extension, like extension implementations. But, yep. um, but this is why this is preview, right? We're just kind of playing with this. We want to see where people go, where the where the paper cuts are, where you know how this could actually be used. So, yeah, and we want to make sure that we're actually addressing the problems. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> it always always helps to ship something that actually solves problems rather than something we think it does. Yeah. All right. So I think that's everything we had. Nice. Uh, so you can you can find uh, the C sharp language design on GitHub at .NET slash C sharp lang. Uh, that's where people make proposals, and that's where we do the actual like, hey, this is what the next version of the language is going to be, and here's how that's going to be spec'd and yeah, stuff like that. Uh, and then there's .NET slash Roslyn, which is the actual C sharp compiler. It's where Chris and I do all of our work, yeah. uh, literally all of it. There's nothing internal; it's all public. Yep, you can, uh, you you can, can see us day to day committing, writing on PRs, uh, editing code. Yep. So. Um, and then Chris is on Twitter. Um, I'm again not on Twitter, uh, but you can find me in Discord uh, at discord.gg slash C sharp. Uh, I hang out in the Roslyn channel along with several other language design team members. So, so if you're interested, like we, we, we always love contributions. Um, on C sharp Lang, obviously, like you can go as far as proposing new language features. People do, we've accepted them. Um, but even just going on and hitting the thumbs up button on the issues you like, like we said about the, the, uh, the field backed properties, the, um, you know, that's the thing that people have given us that they, they want to use. And so going on and thumbing and, and hearting things on GitHub is a great way to actually influence what we're going to do with the language next. So uh, we do encourage people to go and go and share their ideas. I was actually going to ask this. If Florian wants his own version of a, a struct with his own flavor of things, how, how can he ask for it? So yeah, so I mean... Pointed out. Right. So on, on C-sharp Lang, we have, uh, there's two things. There's issues, which we try to reserve for uh, fully specified things that have had some community development at this point, right? Uh, so, so issues are things that basically the LDM can actually look at and say, the community is interested in this. Uh, someone from the, on the team is interested in this. And let's, let's take a look and see if we want the feature. And if we do want the feature, how is it going to work? Um, and then we have discussions, which is the new uh, uh, feature that GitHub added a few months ago, and those are more free form of, hey, I think this idea is cool, um, and that's more that's more of a like a community, hey, let's let's try and work on some rules and see if see if we can attract anyone to be interested in it. And often it turns out like I mean the the repo, you know the language is pretty old, and so a lot of these ideas have already been batted around, and so we have like in the discussions it's often the oh actually this is quite similar to some other idea so let's kind of meld the two and and you know maybe we have new ideas about how to fix things so uh, it's a good a good place to start there super so uh, it's really exciting to see how the language is uh, evolving and thanks thanks for sharing a little bit uh, about the process that you're, that you're applying so uh, i would be curious so when you decide of course it's based on popularity and, and demand. But what other things are to be considered uh, when sure. deciding to implement or not some of the features that the community is uh, asking for? Uh, so so some of it, of course, is is gut feeling, right? Uh, the, the C Sharp language design, while we, while we take input from the community and we, we do all of our work in the open, it is ultimately a group that looks at a thing and says, we, we like this or we don't. Uh, but we also try and 
keep in mind some partner scenarios. Um, like for example, in C Sharp 9, we added function pointers, which is this low level thing uh, that's going to help the BCL and it's gonna help a few high performance libraries do a lot of things much faster. And 99% mm -hmm. uh, of C Sharp developers are never gonna touch function pointers. They don't care about them. They don't wanna know about them. It has the word pointer in it, it's unsafe. Uh, <laughs> but the but the people who do want it, the people who, who you know, the 100 people who are gonna use it are gonna make everyone else's lives that much better. Um, and so that's, the, that's the, uh, the other type of thing that we try and keep in mind is it's not just popularity, it's what impact is this gonna have on the language and the ecosystem? Yeah, and I, I think often a lot of it is about the, the smaller you can scope something such that it works with other things, right? The interesting thing about a language like C Sharp, it's so big is that, the constant thing is the interaction with other features, right? And so if you come along and say, oh, I've got this massive new thing that requires all these extra syntax and everything, that's like quite a hard thing to get past because there's so much to think about. If you break that down into 10 separate micro features that when combined create the overall thing, it's much easier to land each of those individual things. And then, you know, maybe you can go use them elsewhere as well. So you say, oh, well, actually this little feature, although it was designed for this big thing, it's actually really useful for these other things in the way it interacts. So, so generally we look for things that can decompose into smaller parts that we can, we can take in separately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing, one thing I forgot to mention was, um, uh, we, so the language design team uh, does, does meetings twice a week for about two hours on Mondays and Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday mornings. Um, and then we post notes about them. Specifically, I take notes during the meeting um, and then I type them up and I put them into a, a nice digestible form of uh, here's, here's what we decided. You know, we looked at these factors and this is the conclusions that we came to. And so you can find the notes and, and I'll be typing up the notes for yesterday's meeting later today. Um, and you can find them on C Sharp Lang in the meetings folder. Uh, you can, we have a readme for every year and you can see what we discussed on what day and then there's a link to take you to the meeting notes for that day. Well, so this is all public now. All and public. That's so cool. Uh, it's been, yeah. it's been, the language notes have been public since we pu published, to, started publishing to CodePlex uh, when, mm -hmm. you know, back in, when that yeah. was a thing. A while ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. So then, Florin, if you're excited about one of the features the guys talked about in C Sharp 10, you can look at the meeting notes and say, oh, damn it, they just dropped this. <laughs> they just dropped this one. But I will, I will insist, of course, and I will find other channels to propose again. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I would suspect that you're also getting inspiration from languages such as Python that there are growing uh, in popularity. Yeah, absolutely. We, I mean, language design, you know, we, everyone cribs from each other in many ways, right? Like, sure. um, like Kotlin copies other, Kotlin copies Swift, who copies us, who copies, who, and then we copy Kotlin and, you know, and Rust, uh, uh, Chris pointed out, you know, as we were adding static things, well, that looks a lot like Rust traits or Haskell type classes. Like there's a, a lot of the theory behind all of these languages is, you know, very, very similar to each other. Um, and language, you know, the, all, all, the, all these languages that I mentioned are doing great things and they're doing very interesting things. And it's not, and a lot of it is a matter of looking at, look, oh, people really like using this feature. How can we do a C-sharp take on it, yeah. right? And it's because we don't want to just blindly copy things. We want to make sure that it feels like C-sharp. Yeah. Um, and which is, which is pretty important to us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, then, and for us as developers, I mean, uh, you know, uh, finding a feature that, that doesn't fit. I mean, it just changes the paradigm completely. And it's a singular example then with suspect, you know, it's, yeah. 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 We want we want to make sure it still feels like you're using the same C sharp that you've come to know and love. It just is a little bit smarter. Excellent. Yeah. And you tend to write less and less code and then that, that's good. It makes you more productive. So I like, I think a lot of the new features, but some of them are also uh, scary. I mean, yeah, it's cool that if I'm going back to your example, if I don't uh, have to declare that dictionary again and uh, uh, two times at least in a row, it's so nice. But then if I look at uh, yeah, the new uh, instantiate or declare a product, and uh, then you have new and a couple of nested news. When you read that code in uh, two weeks, will I understand it myself? Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's always that balance, right? Between 
making a very writable language and a very readable language because certainly there's there's, there's a there's a boundary somewhere and you know we don't always get that right i think the nice thing that c sharp's pretty good is that you're never forced into anything right so it's like if you if there's features you like you can use them i mean i think for an example for me is the like uh single like var using right which came out in c sharp uh, eight and, and then some you don't have any it. special attachment to that one, right, Chris? Oh, you got it. was actually my very <laughs> first feature. I, I did a little while. But, uh, but like some people love it and some people really, really hate it because they're like, oh, the scope's gone. And, you know, and I'm just like, okay, well, don't use it. You know, it's kind of like, yeah. And so I think that's kind of the nice thing. It's, it's, you, it, it's a very flexible language in that way. Um, and I think we do try and get the balance between making it easy to write code. And I mean, you know, we always say this because every, every less line of code you write is one less bug. Right? Like okay. if you if you write less things, there's less chances to get it wrong. Um, so it's not just about the speed of typing. It really is about the more things you can get the compiler to do for you, the more we can be correct. Um, but certainly, yeah, we want to make sure that when you come back to it in five years, you can still understand what it is you've written. Or even in five days, you can still understand what you've actually written. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And an important, important thing for the language design team is that we want to look at it and we it's not just about code golfing things, right? If we wanted to code golf things, maybe we'd add var far fields right um or or we'd add these some some other language examples that you know they, they make things shorter but they don't help expressiveness so like one of the new one of the new big features that we've been pushing on for the past couple of releases is patterns right we've added new patterns and new ways of doing this type of declarative pattern matching and that's not just about removing a whole bunch of if checks it's about making it clearer to read up front and so you can say in a case you can say oh i'm digging out this property and i'm matching it against this value and it's much easier to read that and understand that than it is to understand the if this is question dot question dot question dot equals something and and question dot question dot question dot equals something right much clearer to understand this recursive pattern that checks to nested properties than it is to and 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 that will make sure it doesn't it doesn't cause null reference exceptions you know it's it's, it's a lot of code that you don't have to write and it's still clear and understandable yeah so since you guys had a very such a nice presentation and and and, and the discussions were so good we decided not to have a break between the presentations. So, Sorry uh, about that. No, no, no. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's a good thing, I would say. Uh, and I, I'd also uh, like to invite uh, Anna Hoffman, who is your colleague. I don't know if you know each other, but that's a good opportunity to meet each other. Hello, Anna. Do you know these guys? Hello. Hello. I don't believe we've met. No, I don't, think we've no met. I, I don't think we have met, but it's nice to meet you guys. And this is a hard act to follow. This was a great session. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank so you. They, their compilers are compiling ours, you know, you know, the... <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, it's good that we had the opportunity to, to make this introduction. Uh, we will thank you once again, and we're looking forward to having you in, in, in Romania at some point. Yeah, because yeah, this conversation would have happened in the hallways between presentations. Yeah, exactly. It's, so, uh, yeah, the this is world, the best next thing. <laughs> hopefully we'll be all back together in person next year, so... Good. So right. until next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.